Chapter 18 of the Singing Mouse Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph Eric. The Singing Mouse Stories by Emerson Ho. Chapter 18 The Bell and the Shadows. Melody Unformulate. Music immaterial. Such was the voice of the singing mouse, faint, small, and clear. A piping of fives so fine, a touching of strings so delicate, that it seemed to come from instruments of beryl and of diamond. A phantom music, impossible to fetter with staff or bar, and past the hope of compassing in words. It was the last night of the year, and the bell upon the church nearby had made many strokes the last time it had been heard, many heavy strokes, which throbbed sullenly, mournfully on the air. The presence of passing time was at hand. The year would soon join the years gone by. Regret, remorse, despair, abandonment, the hopelessness of humanity. Was it the breath of these which arose and burdened heavily the note of the chronicling bell? Where were the chimes of joy? These shadows that you see are not upon the wall, said the singing mouse. They are very much beyond the windows. If only we will look out from our windows, there are always great pictures waiting for us. Pictures in pearl and opal, in liquid argent, in crimson and gold. But always there must be the shadows. Without these, there can be no picture anywhere. Have you not seen what the shadows do? Have you not seen them trooping through the oak forest in the evening, through the pine forest in open day, across the prairies under the moon at night, legions of them, armies of them? Have you never seen them march across the grasslands in the daytime, cohort after cohort hurrying to the call of the unseen trumpets? In the woods, have you never heard strange sounds when you put your ear to the ground? Sounds untraceable to any animate life. Have you never heard vague voices in the trees? Have you not heard distant, mysterious noises in the forest? Whose cause you could never learn, seek, no matter how you might. These were the voices of the shadows, the people who live there. Who else should it be to whisper and sing to you and make you happy when you are there? Without these people, what would be the woods, the prairies, the waters, the sky, the world? Without the shadows too, what would be our lives? Thoughts, thoughts, and remembrances. What have we that is sweeter than these? Have you never seen the smile upon the lips of those who have died? They say they are looking upon the future. Perhaps they look upon the past and therefore smile in happiness, seeing again youth and hope and faith and trust which are tender and beautiful things. Life has no actuality of its own, and in material sense is only a continual change. But the shadows of thought and of remembrance do not change. It is only the shadows that are real. As I pondered upon this, there passed by many pleasant pictures upon the wall. After the way the singing mouse had many pictures of days gone by, which made me think that perhaps what the singing mouse had said was true. 
I could see the boy sitting idle and a dream, watching the shadows drifting across the clover fields where the big bees came. I saw the youth wandering in the woods where the squirrels lived, loitering and looking, peering into corners full of the secrets of the wild creatures, unraveling the delicious mysteries which nature never offers to those not yet grown old. It was a comfortable picture, full of the brilliant greens of springtime, the mellow tints of summer, the red and russet of autumn days, the blue and white of winter. I could hear also sounds intimately associated with the scenes before me, the bleat of little lambs, the low of cattle, the neighing of a distant horse, and then both sound and scene progressed, and once more, as the woods and hills grew bolder and more wild, I could hear clearly the rifle's thin report, could note the whisper of the secret loving paddle, the slipping of the snowshoe on the snow, the clatter of the hoofs of horses, the baying of the bell-mouthed hounds. The delights of it all came back again, and in this varied phantom chase among the keen joys of the past, I saw as plainly and exultantly as ever in my life the panorama of the brown woods and the grey plains and the purple hills. Saw it distinctly, with all the old vibrant joy of youth. Line for line, sound for sound, shadow for shadow, joy for joy. And then, the singing mouse, without wish of mine, caused these scenes to change into others of more quiet sort, which told not of the fields, but of the home. In the shadows of evening, I seemed to see a pleasant place, well surrounded by trees and flowers the leaves of which were stirred softly in the breath of a faint summer breeze, strong enough only to carry aloft in its hands the odour of the blooming rose. This picture faded slowly. There were shadows in the spaces between the trees. There were shadows in the dark growing vine which draped a column. One could only guess if he caught sight of garb or of the outline of a form among the shadows, he could only guess too whether he heard music faint as the breeze, faint as the incense of the flowers. He could only guess if he had seen the image of the house beautiful, that temple known as home. Thoughts, said the singing mouse softly. Thoughts and remembrances. These are the things that live forever. It is only the shadows that are real. The solemn note of the bell struck in. It counted twelve. The new year had come. The chimes of joy arose. But still, the faint music from the past had not died away. And still the shadows waved and beckoned on the wall, strong and beautiful and enduring, and not like the fading of a dream. So then I knew that what the singing mouse had said was true, and that it is indeed only the shadows that are real. End of chapter 18